Welcome back to the EPRS Chronicles. This is our third and final episode on our series on climate change. In episodes one and two, we explored the effects of climate change and what can be done on a global and European level to mitigate them. This episode will focus on climate change adaptation. And for that, I'm joined by Henrique Simoes, EPRS policy analyst specialized in climate change. Hello, Enrique. Nice to see you again. Hello, Kelly. So let's start with the term. What do we mean when we say climate change adaptation? Well, climate change adaptation is the process of adjusting to actual or expected climate and its effects. It is important to, to define three, uh, three important concepts in order to act on climate change adaptation. The first one being vulnerability, which is how likely are you to be adversely affected? The next one is risk, which is the potential of negative consequences with when something of value is at stake. And the final one is impact, which is the consequences of the risk in the system. It is important also to highlight that there are limits to adaptation. So in some cases, there is no chance of adaptation, like for example, island states where there's no, 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 no chance for population relocation, or in other cases where the option to adapt, it's still not available. And is climate change a priority globally? Currently, uh, the, the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, they already have plans, strategies, laws and policies that are getting better and more inclusive, but they're still lacking funding in order to take the next step that is to pass on to action. Uh, the international funding that it's directed towards developing countries is also identified as being five to ten times lower than it should be by now. So would you say that we are falling short? Well, I wouldn't say that uh, because implementation of adaptation uh, actions are increasing, including the ones that involve nature-based solutions, but it's not keeping up with climate impacts. And therefore, we need a strong political will in order to increase adaptation investments and outcomes. In a nutshell, global efforts are, are being made but the funding is still lagging behind. Okay. And what about nature-based solutions? Can you tell us what their role is in climate change adaptation? Well, nature-based solutions, they encompass a range of ecosystem-based approaches that aim to increase the resilience to climate change. Those are typically stakeholder-driven mm -hmm. and they are tailor-made for a specific region or local. Mm -hmm. um, they can deliver services such as erosion control, drought or flood prevention. The examples of nature-based solution typically include coastal zone protection, wetland restoration, and agroforestry amongst mm -hmm. others. And it's uh, curious enough that some natural coastal defense projects, they have been found to be between two to five times more cost-effective than engineering projects. Nevertheless, there are still knowledge gaps to be filled in order to fully roll out these solutions as a valid climate change adaptation action. Well, what kind of knowledge gaps are we talking about? Uh, can we fill them? Well, um, knowledge is vital to make the correct choices. And when we're talking about climate change adaptation, which needs effective actions, uh, we feel that there's the, the need to gather more and better information, especially on economic losses. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are a number of sources that are, that are available to the, to the public. They are open source. They, some of them are tailor-made for local authorities to go and find information. Mm -hmm. Amongst these, we have the Climate Adapt platform or the Covenant of Mayors on Climate Change and Energy, which currently counts with a little over 11,000 signatories and represent roughly 30% of the European population. And you mentioned open source. Uh, what would be accessible at a local or regional level? The local or regional level has been identified as being one of the major key stakeholders within the, the, um, the adaptation processes. Mm -hmm. And both within the, the Cov Covenant of Mayors, there are a multitude of tools and, and, um, and services provided, like in project matchmaking. But in, uh, in terms of nature-based solutions, it also exists. There are uh, numerous open source platforms available 
to the local and regional, regional level. I would just like to highlight one that was able to develop uh, a handbook and an appendix of methods mm -hmm. that local and regional authorities and everyone in general can make use in order to identify the best nature-based solution for their, for their intentions. I'd like to briefly go back to something we spoke about in episode two in more detail. Uh, we mentioned uh, mitigation of climate change and uh, what the EU is doing in order to mitigate its effects. Do we see a link, a relationship between climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation? Could they work jointly? Well, it's a good question. And there are potential benefits in having them both work together. Mm -hmm. As we know that mitigation actions, they take a long time to affect rising temperatures. Therefore, adaptation to current change is needed. Uh, as both mitigation and adaptation address the same cause of impact, they need to work in an integrated manner to successfully achieve their respective aims. Uh, there are opportunities to be taken when integrating mitigation and adaptation aspects at the same time in different stages, being it in the planning stage, in the investment stage, or the finance stage. One example of this could be an ad adaptation option that chooses to increase the use of air conditioning units, which would then mean that we would have an increased consumption of energy, but that trade-off can be minimized if we mitigate the, that consumption of energy by introducing a renewable energy source to power those air conditioning units. But nevertheless, funding that addresses simultaneously adaptation and mitigation uh, actions is still very, very short. Where does the EU stand uh, when it comes to climate change adaptation? Well, the EU launched this first strategy back in 2013. Mm -hmm. In 2021, it uh, revised the strategy. And even if it did not introduce any legislative proposal, it did highlight some key areas that we have already discussed here today mm -hmm. and also in previous episode. Uh, w one of them being the, the need to close the knowledge gaps in order to have better action and more informed action. The other one, it's to fully roll out nature-based solutions, but also to involve the insurance sector and to increase the financing options. According to the strategy, climate change adaptation in Europe should be both smarter, which means that falls back again into, the, into, into what we were talking about in closing knowledge gaps in order to have better and more accurate adaptation options. It should be faster because the effects of climate change, they're already being felt. Mm -hmm. So we need to roll out adaptation actions as soon as possible. And it should be systemic, meaning that it should cover all levels of society and across all sectors. And finally, it also identifies the importance of providing support to developing countries, which is again falling into what we already discussed. And this needs to be done through the scaling up of international uh, finance through global engagement and exchanges on adaptation, all that we mentioned before. Thank you very much, Enrique. You're welcome. To find out more about climate change, its effects, mitigation and adaptation, please click on the link in the description or visit EP Think Tank.